Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging the continuous presence of indigenous peoples on this land for thousands of years. We stand on Nanatuck land. I also acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. I'm Tim Johnson. I'm the director of the Botanic Garden of Smith College, and welcome. Tonight, we are celebrating the opening of our 2020 bulb show with a lecture and a previewing of the bulb show. I want to start with a public service announcement regarding COVID-19 virus. Individuals considering attending events on Smith's campus should stay home if they have a fever, cough, or shortness of breath. If you have these symptoms or should these symptoms appear while you are already on campus, please self-isolate and contact your primary health care provider. Individuals who have traveled to CDC alert level three countries, currently China, Iran, Italy, and South Korea are not permitted on Smith's campus until they have self-isolated and remained symptom-free for a minimum of 14 days. Tonight marks a couple of important events. The first, uh, or I want to call attention to a couple of upcoming important events. The first is that in December of this year, the Botanic Garden of Smith College turns 125 years old. <laughs> It's quite an accomplishment. Uh, I also want to call attention to Smith's current year on climate change initiative, a campus-wide project to put climate change at the center of our learning, teaching, and action. The climate crisis is arguably among the greatest threats humanity has ever faced and is certainly the most far-reaching as it impacts us all. The coming decades will be fraught with contradictions, both more heavy rain events and more droughts, more blizzards and less overall snowfall. We will see predictably warmer oceans and less predictable seasonal bird migrations, as well as more new pest invasions and less overall biological diversity. It's not unrelated. We will also continue to see a growing economic resource use and social services chasm. Tonight's speaker has been a critical voice of resilience, hope, scientifically supported action at a time when hope and clarity seem hard to find. We're fortunate to have Eric with us tonight as well as to have him as a member of our community. Uh, Sarah Loomis will be up shortly to share a little bit more about Eric and uh, introduce him properly. After the lecture, I want to invite you to please join us in Lyman Plant House to kick off the bulb show uh, and to be a part of the year on climate change. Our event co-sponsors Smith College Dining Services and the Center for the Environment, Ecological Design and Sustainability have teamed up to bring you a low carbon footprint reception. And the rumor is that there are cricket flower cupcakes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> a couple of thank yous. Uh, first, uh, would the members in our audience who are friends of the Botanic Garden please stand up to be acknowledged? Thank you. Thank you. Members make this event and our extensive student programming possible. This summer, we will invest over $60,000 into paid student internships, funding that comes in, in part from our friends members. If helping to make such programming possible, programs like tonight's, is not enough motivation, I'm going to offer you a chance to both support the Botanic Garden of Smith College and spend more of your time outside this spring and summer. You can become an individual member for as little as $50 a year and enjoy one of our most important benefits, which is participation in the Reciprocal Garden Entry Program. The program provides members free or reduced cost entry to over 20 gardens in Massachusetts alone and over 300 gardens around the country. To become a member, you can visit garden.smith.edu, or you can actually sign up and become a member tonight over at the Bulb Show in Lyman. Finally, I want to thank uh, our extended network of people who make these events possible. Uh, to our volunteers, will you please also stand up? If it is an evening event, if it is a weekend event, if it's a bad weather event, it doesn't happen without our volunteers. So thank you all so very much for your time and dedication. I also want to thank 
Smith Dining for co-sponsoring this event uh, and reception, in particular Andy Cox, Dino Giordano, Patty Hentz, and Kathy Amarante. In the Botanic Garden, I need to thank our horticulturalist, Dan Babineau, and Steve Soikowski, who have brought together one of our most special uh, bulb shows to date. Uh, I also want to thank our interns and work-study students, Selena Lewis-Bartley, Bridget McNeil, and Dana Berry for their help in, in growing the plants and setting up the show, as well as students in Gabby Immerman's Biology 123 horticulture course for all of their help and work. Thank you also for our partners in Smith College's Skilled Trades for keeping us looking sharp, Jay Lucy, Sarah Sipic, Jim Dawson, and Gary Holman. Uh, and last but not least, I wanna thank Sarah Loomis, our Manager of Education, for tonight's, tonight's program and also for bringing Eric to our campus for a good chunk of this week and, and keeping him engaged with our faculty and with our students. Um, I wanna introduce you then to Sarah Loomis. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everyone. As Tim said, I'm Sarah Loomis. I'm the manager of education here at the Botanic Garden, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Eric is a senior fellow at Project Drawdown, a nonprofit organization with a vision to achieve drawdown, the point when greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere start to decline. He is an appointed lecturer at Yale University and an international trainer presenting in English and Spanish in the United States Canada, Mexico, Guatemala, and the Caribbean. Eric is an, also a, the award-winning author of Paradise Lot and Perennial Vegetables, as well as The Carbon Farming Solution, a global toolkit of perennial crops and regenerative agriculture practices for climate change mitigation and food security. Recently, Eric was named Senior Fellow of the Evergreening Global Alliance a massive effort to scale up the adoption of agroforestry. Eric has studied permaculture and useful plants of the world for over two decades. Though he works globally, he calls the Pioneer Valley home and maintains a very biodiverse home garden in Holyoke, which I cannot wait to see, and is the former farm project director for Nuestas Raices. Please join me in welcoming Eric. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say thanks to Sarah and Gabby and Tim for treating me so nicely and uh, having me a chance to get to meet so many of the um, students and faculty and staff here who are working on these issues. It's really great to hear what's happening over here as part of the um, year of climate change. Let's see. So um, I'm going to give us a walk through the entire food system and how it relates to climate change uh, mitigation and also talk about landscapes in 40 minutes. <laughs> so um, if there are a few details we don't get to, we'll have time for questions afterwards and then we'll go down uh, to the bulb show and get our exclusive uh, pre-show visit and we can talk some more down there. So um, I'll just say very briefly that um, so I've been working in this area for quite a number of years, uh, about 30 years now, and it was about 10 years ago that the climate piece caught my attention when I sort of realized the kinds of agriculture that I was interested in also had great potential to, um, to uh, avert catastrophic climate change. So that's been my uh, more or less full-time advocation for the last decade and, and, or so. Um, so this is sort of the fruit of that. I'm always learning new things. Uh, and we'll, we have a couple new things in here tonight. I've been learning about turf grass carbon this year, for example, very exciting if you're into that sort of thing. Um, so uh, just very briefly to begin, um, the food system is part of uh, anthropogenic emissions, the emissions from humanity, emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, all told, we're at about uh, 23%. So we have, um, uh, a big chunk is from land use change. That's basically cutting down forests and peatlands and grasslands and turning them into farming. We have 12% from the, um, I don't think my math came out right there. Anyway, 12% uh, from agriculture. This is from the brand new IPCC land and um, climate change and land report. Uh, and then another 7% from other food system emissions, which is basically from the supply chain, transportation, processing, and so on about 15% um, of the emissions from the US food system come from 
wet milling of corn, which is how we turn corn into everything else, corn syrup and corn oil and all the other wonderful and horrible things we make from corn. Um, so it's a significant portion of humanity's emissions, the food system. It's a big deal. Uh, and I'll just pull attention to one piece. This is not entirely true, and I'll tell you why in a second, but uh, if food waste was a country, it would be the third highest emitting country in the world. The reason that's not true is China and the US, their food waste is considered in those. So, but just for like representative purposes, it's a big deal, food waste is a big deal. All the emissions in that food that, that were produced in order to create that food are then thrown out. And then it ends up in a landfill and there it turns into methane and so on and so on and so on. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, so it's a big deal. It's not as big a deal as electricity, but it's a big, it's a big deal. It's actually a pretty big contribution, and it's quite a big portion of the solutions uh, as well. So here's a little bit about mitigation, uh, which is what we um, use to mean the things that help make climate change not be so bad, help us walk back. The, um, the, there are sort of five main areas that we're looking at in the food system. The first is reducing the demand for food changing diets to foods that use less land or less emissions intensive, uh, reducing food waste and so on, lives in that part. On the other side, we have the supply chain where we're looking at refrigerants and transportation and processing and so on. And then in the middle, we have these supply side solutions, reducing the emissions from agriculture itself, um, uh, sequestering carbon, which we'll talk about, drawing down excess atmospheric carbon and storing it in soils and in biomass. Um, and then intensification, which is growing more food on the land we have so that we don't need to cut down other forests or ideally so we can even start to reforest and restore ecosystems on some of our farmland. That's sort of the very broad overview we're walking through. And I have a couple websites at the end that you can go to for some more information also if you like. Um, so in terms of the carbon sequestration part, I'm going to ask you, some of you, this might have been today, and some of you it's 50 years ago, remember when you learned about photosynthesis? Some of us, it was quite some time ago. Um, it's this marvelous thing that plants do where they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they strip the carbon off and release the oxygen. And I mostly thought about that as where oxygen comes from because I'm a fan of oxygen. Um, <laughs> But the carbon is used to make all kinds of things, uh, mostly sugars. And those sugars might be put together in long, um, long chains to make fibers and lignans and things like that. Um, some of them end up, uh, those sugars are exuded right away into the soil to feed soil microorganisms. And some of that ends up staying there, some of that off gases again. Some of it becomes organic matter in the soil over time. Um, and organic matter is about 57% uh, carbon um, and can persist for a century or more. Uh, and then some of it is held in the biomass of plants. And in the case of perennial plants, like woody plants, trees, um, it's held for the life of the tree. And then if it's made into a wood product, it's held for the life of that product as well, even longer. Um, so carbon sequestration is marvelous because it allows us to draw down this excess carbon there's sort of a limit to how much you can do. It's not unlimited, and, um, but it offers the potential to achieve net zero emissions, meaning we can, we can reduce our emissions enormously, but we probably can't get them to zero. Carbon sequestration lets us kind of um, make up for the slack there a little bit, and there isn't a way to achieve 1.5 degrees without a lot of uh, carbon sequestration between natural ecosystems and agricultural ecosystems. Um, and this is from the brand new, if any of you have read the Drawdown book, we have a brand new document that was released on Tuesday of this week, um, which has all of our latest numbers. We've been running numbers on all the solutions and putting in all the latest data and so on. It has some kind of new ways of framing it. Um, so we're looking at this point that on the top there we have, uh, let's see, we have um, solutions that reduce the sources of emissions. So we call these um, well, these are the sources, <laughs> reducing sources. And then we have sinks of carbon, that's where carbon sequestration is happening. And if you combine the reduced emissions from um, agriculture and food here with the carbon sequestration sinks, it's actually the largest sector 
that we identified. It has a bigger impact than electricity, a bigger impact than transportation in terms of the mitigation potential, partly because of that carbon sequestration um, that can happen there. And the way that, um, that my new boss at Drawdown talks about this, John Foley, he says, if you have a leak in your bath, if you have a, an overflowing sink in your bathroom, the first thing you do is turn off the sink. That's the emissions. Then you get out the mop, and that's the carbon sequestration. But the order of operations is you start by turning off the sink before you try and mop. That's not going to work very well, because the mop can only hold so much water. It maybe isn't the best metaphor. At some point, it loses some power. OK. Um, and what I just want to say, um, in terms of framing this around climate justice, these are some friends of mine in Guatemala, um, Doña Vict Don Victoriano and Doña Corina. Um, this is where a lot of the world is farming, is on very steep hillsides. So they're raising corn on this steep hillside. So you have a lot of erosion problems. You have landslides. Um, so uh, what they're doing over here is they have an A-frame level, and they're putting out terraces. Um, and uh, these kinds of um, practices like that, they're actually we're trying a bunch of things in this community with various kinds of incorporations of nitrogen fixing trees and certain kinds of agroforestry and perennializing some crops and stuff. Um, uh, we're looking at the communities who've done the least to cause climate change, who are the most impacted by it, and can the effort that we as humanity put into mitigation also make these folks' lives better? That's the idea. And it happens that a lot of the uh, most powerful solutions, agricultural solutions, are currently only viable in the tropics. We don't have breadfruit up here. We don't have staple fruits that grow on trees. We don't have avocados and breadfruits and all those things. We don't have commercial scale um, multi-strat agroforestry systems like shade coffee and shade cacao. Um, we just don't have some of these really powerful tools that are available in the tropics. So if you want the highest impact per acre, your money should go to the tropics. Your mitigation money should go to the tropics. It also is cheaper to do things there as well. So there are some real uh, opportunities for agricultural mitigation to address climate justice in a real way, um, which involves also recognizing and appreciating the work that very innovative farmers are doing and have, in many cases, practices that go back 10,000 years. Um, so uh, I just wanted to take a moment on, on that. Um, none of the practices that we're looking at tonight were developed because of a climate impact. They were developed because they do something good for the farm. They increase resilience. They increase uh, productivity. Uh, or in a few cases, they have some useful benefits to the neighbors of the farm or ecological benefits, like riparian buffers and things like that. Um, but they have benefits to the farm. They have benefits to the wider ecosystem. They have benefits to the farmers, their communities. Um, one of the benefits, actually, is when you can um, agroforestry systems that incorporate trees. Excuse me. Um, like these are uh, some nitrogen-fixing acacias right here um, that are producing firewood. They're cut off at two meters high, and the firewood is harvested repeatedly. They're nitrogen-fixing trees. Underneath, we have um, taro growing in the shade. And then this is also grazed by sheep. So it's a multi-purpose system and has firewood, it has food, it has fodder for livestock um, altogether. When you shrink the many women in the parts of the world, the two billion people who cook with firewood every day, women are walking long distances often to harvest that firewood. And when you can shrink that distance, you shrink the amount of time that people are exposed to violence. And one of the concerns with climate change is as people have to walk farther and farther, one of the issues for women is increasing um, risk of violence. So um, there are a lot of different kinds of benefits um, uh, associated with these systems, which we won't go all into tonight, but I just want to say that they exist. Um, and then there are some risks and drawbacks. No, no system is perfect. Um, the one I want to really mention tonight uh, is about um, land grabs, which is a phenomenon where large bodies of land are bought up. I think it's the definition is um, 500 acres or more. Uh, they're bought up when someone is already on that land. And in much of the tropics, people don't have tenure 
So someone buys their land out from under them, throws them off, sometimes you know, murders or tortures them, as we see in oil palm quite a bit uh, in, in Malaysia and in Indonesia. Um, so there's a risk that uh, as carbon finance mechanisms come into place that pay people for enacting these kinds of practices, huge pieces of land are going to be bought up, people are going to be thrown off their land, and then a big monoculture of something is put in place to produce fuel for bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage, or something like that. So that's, to me, the biggest, most present risk at the moment. But there are lots of different kinds of challenges. The big, it, another big one is that it makes people think that they don't have to stop their emissions and reduce their consumption and stuff. And the potential of, uh, of land to sequester carbon is not big enough to allow us to continue to live the way we live in this country. The, the numbers don't work, and I run those numbers personally. Uh, okay, so first let's talk about a couple practices for reducing demand. Um, the first one is diet. So different kinds of foods have different um, levels of emissions associated with them, right? We have the life cycle analysis, we say. So um, uh, looking at protein, for example, we have on one end the dry beans with very, very low emissions and some of the meat substitutes moving into your monogastric livestock like fish and, and poultry and pork. And then we get into the ruminant livestock where you see these very, very high levels of emissions associated with those foods. That is partly because of the emissions that, um, that ruminants produce as a result of their digestion, that cows and goats and sheep and so forth produce as a result of their digestion. It's also just because it takes a lot of land. Every pound of beef takes about 10 pounds of feed to make it work. So um, that just means a lot of land is being used. And because deforestation is such a huge source of emissions and the, still the leading driver of deforestation is, um, is livestock, whether that's for soybeans or for pasture. So um, if we can figure out how to eat foods that have a lower emission profile, we can do some good. Um, and I'll talk about the positive roles livestock can play. And there are absolutely climate friendly ways to raise livestock, but it still means we eat a lot less of it, is my, my take on it. Um, food waste is the other big place where there's demand reduction opportunities. And this is from the, from the EPA looking at the different um, priorities for reducing uh, food waste. Uh, globally, it's 30 to 40 percent of food is wasted. I think in the U.S. it's about 40 percent. And whereas in uh, the tropics, most of that is lost on its way to the consumer because of a lack of refrigeration and stuff, um, here it's very much a consumer issue. Um, and I still waste way more food at home than I would like to, and I track it well, and I feed what I don't eat to my chickens and so on, but it's still not... Um, it's not ideal. So we want to try and reduce it in the first place, uh, get food that is still edible and good in the hands of people who are hungry. Feeding animals is the next best. Then we have some industrial uses, followed by composting. Composting is great, but it's not the highest and best use of food waste. And then all the way down to the landfill uh, at the end is the least desired element. So these are two big, in fact, in the new version of Drawdown's numbers, I think that food waste and diet were the two highest of all of the solutions. They're really, certainly they're in the top five. It's a really, really big impact. Um, and while so many of these issues are structural and need to change at a big policy and institutional level, and to some degree these are affected by that, um, these are also very personal things that you can do in your own life. Um, so there's a, uh, really at every stage of kind of levels of action, there's something we can do, and these are some of those. So far, so good? All right, okay. I'm trying not to rush you too fast, but there's a few slides I really wanted to put in, and so I'm going to try and keep it tight. Um, so uh, a few things about producing crops and landscape management. These are the plants, things with plants, not ecosystem protection and restoration, which are super important, but a topic for another night. Uh, this is about the um, really our gardens and our, our, our immediate landscapes uh, and our farms. So the first thing is about turf grass. I've been learning about this this year. And um, there are some a couple of really key practices for turf grass management around carbon. Um, the three big things are um, mowing at a longer length, 
leaving the grass no more than no shorter than six inches, which is a pretty big change for a lot of us. Um, and then using a mulching mower so the organic matter stays there and applying compost. Those are the three things that have the highest carbon impact from what we know so far uh, about uh, turf grass management. And adding trees, adding trees and shrubs to your lawn makes a big difference in the, both in the carbon in the soil and obviously in the biomass and the wood of the tree as well. We've been, I, I work with this group, the um, Healthy Soils Action Project, I think, as a state effort to assess the carbon in the soils of Massachusetts and make policy recommendations. So we've been asking what kind of policies can Massachusetts put in place to change the way people mow their lawn? If anybody has good suggestions, they would be welcome. It's tricky. Okay, uh, and in terms of trees, not all trees are equal in their carbon sequestration. And I put this in just because I've always loved the deciduous conifers here at Smith. Um, these are the top three species, uh, native tree species, um, for their carbon sequestration ability, and they're all deciduous conifers. Is that something about the physiology of deciduous conifers? Is it a coincidence? I don't know. Math error? I don't know. But it's certainly really um, something for us to be, to be looking at and thinking about as we think about street trees and so on. Um, is, uh, are they going to live a long time? Do they have dense wood? And are they going to be able to survive? And those were the criteria that were used for this particular. This is from a, um, an article called Urban Trees for Carbon Sequestration, which is a fun read if you're into that sort of thing. Um, so nutrient management is key. One of the biggest, the biggest non-livestock source of emissions in the United States is the use of uh, chemical fertilizers because they off-gas as nitrous oxide, which is 298 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So, um, uh, but there are much better ways, there are alternative sources of fertility that can be used, like compost, cover cropping, nitrogen fixing plants, and so on. But even just using chemical fertilizer, it can be used in better ways. If you use it at the right time, in the right place, if you use a slow release formula, there's lots of different ways to, to time and manage and use chemical fertilizers right so that you greatly reduce the amount of nitrous oxide that is being emitted. Um, and by the way, that has a huge impact on water quality and a number of other kind of issues as well. Um, fertilizer runoff is a big challenge. Um, and I, I, in my garden at home, I use, uh, I mostly don't use chemical fertilizer, but I use slow release pellets in my nursery pots because I can't get organic soil to, organic potting soil to keep a plant alive for all year. It just doesn't work for me. Um, then we have some better ways of raising annual crops. Um, and uh, ideally you do all of them, but it's actually hard to do all of them together. Uh, tilling less, so turning over the soil less often. Every time you turn over the soil, all the organic matter, which remember is full of carbon, is exposed to oxygen. And then the oxygen takes all those little carbon atoms off and turns them into carbon dioxide again. So we want to prevent the tilling of soil. That's a way to keep, uh, keep our carbon in the soil. Applying compost, using cover crops and crop rotation and mulching. The, um, there's sort of two uh, general tracks here. We have the organic track, which does a whole lot of things right, but has to till a lot, which isn't great. And then we have this track called conservation agriculture, which uses crop rotation and cover crops um, and reduced tillage, but does that by using genetically modified crops and herbicide. So we're starting to see that leading farmers from both of those areas are really coming together and merging into this new phenomenon. And one of the ways that is emerging is organic no-till. So we have some mechanized organic no-till. I don't know if there's anybody doing this in the valley yet, but we definitely have people doing the smaller scale organic no-till systems of mulching, using tarps to kill out a cover crop, um, solarizing with clear plastic, uh, which is ugly, but uh, it does the job pretty well. So we're seeing some kind of uh, emerging practices coming out of this, um, these kinds of challenges that, are, that annual cropping systems have. Then we have a whole range of agroforestry systems. These are my personal favorite, or one of my personal favorites. Um, uh, 
windbreaks that are reducing the impact of wind on crops, riparian buffers to protect uh, streams and rivers from runoff, pollinator hedgerows and beetle banks. This is one of my favorite things. These are strips of perennial bunching grasses in the middle of farming fields that provide habitat for predaceous ground beetles that eat uh, insects and weed seeds. Very desirable. Uh, we have uh, various kinds of contour intercropping systems where people run rows of nitrogen fixing trees or other trees along the contour to reduce erosion. Um, in North Korea, it is our aronia, black chokeberry, which is the most popular woody plant used for that role. I've never seen it used for that here by anybody. Um, uh, and then we have intercropping with uh, nitrogen fixing plants. Uh, which is not a real popular agroforestry system here. This is the, these are uh, rows of hazelnuts intercrop with annual crops in England. So there's various ways of doing that here. Um, various kinds of perennials can be intercropped. And then this is a lovely system I love, which isn't particularly appropriate here because we don't grow a lot of winter grains. Winter grains are cool season grasses like um, wheat or barley or rye that are planted in the fall grow over the winter, even if not that rapidly. And um, uh, they're matched with deciduous trees that leaf out later in the year so that they're growing in the same place, but they're not really using the light at the same time, so they're not competing for each other. And around the world, there are all different kinds of systems that use these phenological opportunities, these niches in time, to grow different things in the same place without them competing with each other for light. It's really interesting. All right, and oh, we're doing fine on time too, great, okay. Uh, then we have perennial crops of all different kinds, um, which are marvelous. They, a fruit tree sequesters carbon just like a forest tree, although it's usually a lot smaller, so there's gonna be less. And that, it happens that the perennial vegetables are a particular interest of mine, but there are all different kinds of amazing perennial crops that do all kinds of amazing things, food and um, uh, fodder for livestock, but also industrial plants that produce long chain hydrocarbons like uh, milkweed has been used to produce gasoline in the past and they're domesticating milkweed as a fiber crop right now. All kinds of interesting things are out there. Um, the food forest system is um, sort of a m using perennials in a way that mimics the structure of a natural forest, but most things are food producing. This is my garden. This was us in 2004 and this was us last year. So there's, you can see there's more biomass now. There's substantially more biomass. Sometimes there's a little too much biomass, quite frankly. That, that is our new problem, is dealing with that. Um, but this kind of restoration also of degraded land, you know, this, was, this part was just construction fill. There was 0% organic matter, and now we're up to close to 9% organic matter in some parts of our garden, which is a really nice boost. We don't get credit for all that. Some of it we brought in as wood chips and bought in compost and things like that, but um, we have grown a fair amount of that carbon ourselves. And then our last one, did any of you here see Michelle Gabriella Parish when she was here this week? Nobody, all right, she's great. She was just here this week out from Colorado. Productive restoration is um, undertaking ecological restoration using useful plants, useful native plants. Uh, and this particular project is eco-cultural restoration where we were working to uh, restore a particular landscape in Colorado to what it might have been like under indigenous management in partnership with some indigenous people in the area there um, based on what we could figure out about what plants we know were used, what we know about what kind of fire management was happening there and how those same plants are used, were managed in other parts of the country where there's better documentation what was cultivated, what was coppiced, what was fire managed, and so on. So we put together kind of a guide for them. It was really fun, really interesting project. So those are our plant-based approaches, and now we will look at some livestock ones. This is where all the good, juicy stuff gets. So let's start with some of the bad news. Um, livestock are using 64% uh, of the world's farmland much of which is grassland that isn't necessarily suited to anything else, but they're using most of the land. Um, they're eating a third of the crops that we grow, but they're only producing 10% of the 
calories while making 80% of our emissions and 14% of agricultural emissions and 14% of humanity's emissions overall. That's not a very good scorecard. They are really delicious. No argument there. As an ex-vegan, I can say I really enjoyed them very much. Um, but so there are very serious issues with livestock. They, you need a lot more land per pound of food. Um, and there are a number of other challenges associated with livestock. And this is one of the reasons behind the plant-based diet or plant-rich diets being having such a powerful impact. Um, great, okay. However, uh, there are also some interesting ways to raise livestock. This was a really great study uh, that looked at AMP grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, sort of very sophisticated, fancy, high intensity management grazing in Minnesota. And they found that when you compared the emissions per kilogram of meat, the feedlot was better than the fancy grazing. And that's what we find in general, is that feedlot meat is lower in emissions than fancy grazing meat of any kind. However, when you include the carbon sequestration of a good management system, uh, we actually bring it down so it's negative emissions, which is really neat. However, it still takes twice as much land to make the same amount of food. So yes, there are some climate friendly ways to produce livestock, but we don't get to eat as much livestock if we want to use only those. Uh, there are some real advantages of livestock agroecologically. They can eat things that we can't eat. They can be raised in places that are hard to grow crops. When they're integrated with crops, they can provide some really interesting benefits. Um, they can eat food waste. They can eat corn stalks and things like that. They can eat grasses and the trees of leaves that we're unable to eat. These are benefits. Um, but um, there's also no argument that if everybody was vegan, it would be really an outstanding thing for the climate. It would be a really great thing. So there's a bit of a, uh, there's these sort of very opposing camps where you're either supposed to eat three grass-fed steaks a day and that's what's best for climate, or be a vegan and that's what's best for climate. And when you look at the science, it's a little more nuanced and interesting than that, but there's no denying that a vegan diet is spectacular, and thank you if you're doing it. Um, the scenario that I like best for livestock is called livestock on leftovers. The idea here is that no animals eat anything that a person could eat. And how much would be left over if they were only eating things that we can't eat? We can't eat pasture very well. We can eat some tree leaves, but mostly we don't. We, we, we're obviously not eating food waste. So how much could we get? Um, this is, an, this is the World Health Organization's estimate of how much protein people should get, including plant and animal protein. This is how much Americans are eating just of animal protein. Um, and uh, these are some estimates of how much might be available from these kind of grazing uh, livestock on leftovers type scenarios, um, which there's some really nice publications have been coming out about that lately. It works out to the equivalent of three eggs per day or a piece of meat the size of a box of cards, the size of a pack of cards. That would be the global share. Um, and um, there are some ways to improve that. Some of these kinds of practices can be more intensified in certain ways. There's also aquaculture that can be added to this. But the basic picture is if we want to raise livestock not in feedlots, and only in sort of sustainable, climate-friendly ways, we get less of it. Um, that's my analysis of the situation. We can talk about it later. If we want to fight about it, it's fine. Uh, OK, so some of these kinds of livestock systems include uh, basic and advanced managed grazing. Um, you see a lot of people here in the valley doing this up in the hill towns and stuff, moving the animals around using um, um, electric portable fences and so on, which is a lovely practice. Its climate potential has been wildly oversold, or there was a period where its climate potential was wildly oversold, which you keep seeing biochar will save us all, holistic grazing will save us all, whatever the next one is going to be, um, uh, vertical farming, lab-grown meat. Nothing is going to save us all except changing everything fast. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but one practice I do really like is silvopasture, which is the planting of trees or the permitting of trees to grow in pastures. Um, and you get very high sequestration rates with these silvopasture systems. There's a lot of benefits to the animals in terms of animal welfare. Um, it increases the, the productivity. Um, and uh, whereas in some of these grazing systems, the emissions and um, sequestration are pretty close to each other or emissions can be still higher than sequestration, in silvopasture systems, it's way a win for the climate. So I feel like for all the debating we've had about this kind of system, we really should be looking at this in places where there's enough rainfall for trees to grow. Um, and it makes the cows happy. They hang out in the shade. They like shade, right? OK, some other systems, fodder banks, where people grow um, uh, giant grasses or woody plants and cut them and carry them and bring them to their livestock, which you see in some smaller scale places various ways of integrating crops and livestock together, which we see. Um, in this case, this is grazing under orchards. That's a really widespread system in some parts of the world. Um, like uh, coconuts with cattle underneath. And actually, it increases the yield of coconuts, not because they produce more coconuts, but because the cows graze the grass down lower and you can find the coconuts. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? I did not know that. Um, and then we have, uh, and then there's integrating crop, uh, livestock into your crop rotations and having them graze down your cover crops and all kinds of things. There's a lot of lovely things people are doing with that, um, most of which are not quantified or haven't been studied in any way in terms of their carbon impact, but farmers report good results. And then we have better feeds for those animals. In this case, this is a local business here. This is Walden. Walden Hill pork. They collect acorns on a big scale. They distribute them to a couple of uh, pork producers they work with. The pigs eat the acorns, and then the Walden Hill people market the acorn fattened pork and get a really nice price premium for it. I ate some, it was really good. Um, so among the many, 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 many things we could talk about here, there's things that you can feed to livestock, to ruminant livestock that reduce their um, production of enteric methane. Usually about 10 or 20 percent, not a lot, including tree leaves. So um, silvopasture systems where you're harvesting tree leaves and feeding them to livestock also reduce their methane production a bit. Um, you can breed livestock to produce less methane. That's pretty cool. There's all kinds of stuff. I could go on and on for hours. I have a 18 hour, I have a 30 hour lecture I do on this, as you don't want. But um, OK, so just a couple things in the supply chain that we can do. Um, uh, let's see. Let's talk about transportation for a minute. For a long time, there was this notion that food miles were a really, really important climate strategy. And um, then there was this sort of backlash against this when we found that. Um, in many cases, local food has worse emissions than food that came from halfway around the world that's in the supermarket. I really decided to drill down into this and find out what are people talking about and how can this possibly be the case. OK, so we're just going to break it down for a minute. Two supply chain distances, right? If all things are equal, the longer one is going to have more emissions, right? But the efficiency of different kinds of transport are so different that it can be better to get something from halfway around the world than to drive to a farm to get it yourself. Because the individual car is just the worst thing. Except for an airplane. Nobody flies to the farm to get the food, I guess. Um, so um, so uh, the, the general guideline is if it's within about 20 miles, the emissions are better um, uh, from somewhere local. But beyond that, you're better off at the supermarket, except for things that are flown in, like berries from South America this time of year, which I buy for my son. He loves them. Um, but those are bad. Airplanes are not great for emissions. Um, and the, the issue here really is that our transportation system is built for the individual car. And that's something that has to shift. And what I really like as a model here is the food hub. 
where um, a bunch of producers bring their product to a single facility and it gets um, sort of, uh, you know, whatever, washed and packed and, and, and um, aggregated, put together so that you're going out in larger trucks. Those trucks are full because a half full truck has really bad emissions per kilo of, of what it's moving. Um, so it's, it's, it's larger, so it's more efficient, it's full. Um, and, uh, and then it goes right to the supermarket where people are already driving anyway, so they don't have to do an extra drive. If you drive here for your uh, strawberries and here for your cilantro, that's more driving and more driving is the enemy. That's not farmer's fault for trying to make a living in this extremely challenging economy for farmers and doing a great and creative job. But ultimately, we need to rebuild our transportation system. And when we do that, local food will make more sense. But I do think food hubs could be marketing themselves much better as a um, as like the ultimate climate friendly transport for food. And some one of my students is now looking at how about bringing food waste back from those supermarkets in the same trucks to the food hub and building a biorefinery there to make industrial products out like bioplastics out of that food waste. Then you're making it even more efficient. So we just need to start thinking like this. Um, uh, a little better than we are. Okay, the other big issue on the demand, I'm sorry, on the supply chain side is refrigerants. Um, refrigerants are, what we talked about how nitrous oxide is like almost 300 times worse than carbon dioxide. Some of these are thousands of times worse, 2,000, 5,000 times worse than carbon dioxide in terms of their warming potential. And um, the issue is uh, in leakage, while they're being used, but also at end of life. When a, when a refrigerator or an air conditioner is done, um, that stuff escapes. So we need places to be able to take that stuff out at the end of life, like the Amherst dump, we'll do that. Um, but also we need to come up with new chemicals to replace those refrigerants. And actually this is one of the very hopeful stories. There was a Kigali Accords a couple of years ago where all the big refrigerant companies got together and said, great, We'll swap it out. We already did it once with ozone. It didn't hurt us. It didn't ruin our industry. We're going to do it again. They're doing what the fossil fuel companies would do if they were being reasonable. So they're facing them out like this is underway. This is happening. Um, and the trick is that in, in much of the world to reduce food waste, we need to increase refrigeration, which uses more electricity and has, uses more of these. But we have to do that. And da, da, da. these things have their impacts, these trade-offs on each other, right? Um, it's not perfect, but this is a big deal. And in the first edition of Drawdown, refrigerant management was the most powerful individual solution. It's a really, really, really big thing that I had never thought of before. Most of us had never thought of before. Um, so it's something for us to think about uh, in, in our supply chain. There are a number of other supply chain solutions or sustainable sourcing and various kinds of efficiencies along the slide. supply chain. There's more efficient processing and so on. We don't really have studies about any of those yet, so we don't really know. In the recent IPCC report on land and climate change, there's a whole chapter on this kind of stuff, and mostly what they said was nobody knows. Some Smith students, please pay attention and get to work on that. Save us all, please. Um, okay, just a couple of policy things, things one might advocate for, uh, and then we'll wrap it up on time-ish, right? Yeah, unbelievable, okay. Um, Looking at some federal policies, I think a change in administration is probably the most critical thing we could do here on climate change. Um, for the next couple of millennia for humanity, this is a pretty critical uh, election, really. Okay, we have about, um, in the US, about $20 billion a year of agricultural subsidies which are mostly going in the wrong direction. So that's money that can be moved around. In fact, globally, it's estimated that annual agricultural subsidies are about $700 billion, and about 99% of them go to things that are bad for the environment. <laughs> so we could do a better job, and there's money. There's money. We can shift the money in another direction. Um, and if you can change federal diet recommendations, some countries have had good luck with this. Every public school, every government cafeteria has to produce food that's in line with those recommendations. So if you can shift that to a healthier diet with some more vegetables and plants in it, 
Uh, that would make a really big impact across the country. So that's another place that you can make uh, make an impact. And I really recommend this um, this chapter by Lehner and Rosenberg. It's called Legal Pathways to Carbon. Oh, that's the older one. It's in a new guide that just came out recently called, there's one here on campus. It's called Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States. And this is the agriculture chapter. It's the best thing I've seen um, a very comprehensive overview of U.S. agricultural policy and climate change mitigation. It's really, really well done, um, if you like that sort of thing, <laughs> again. Uh, and then just a few, st there's millions of more things we could say here, right, but we're not going to go there. In terms of some state policies, um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service of USDA has a program called EQIP, which is a payment for environmental service program. We pay farmers to implement practices that are good for the environment in some way. Um, and there's a nationally approved list that has lots and lots of different things on it. But then each state selects their priorities. And they only fund some of those. And that's actually a pretty easy thing to change. I think it's the Association of Conservation Districts that decides that for Massachusetts. Every year or every couple years, they decide which ones they want to fund. So if enough people decided to call that office and say, hey, we'd really like to see these things put on that list, that might not be such a hard thing to change. And you don't have to wait for federal policy to change. They're already on the approved list. They just have to be on the approved and funded list, which is a decision that's made within Massachusetts. Um, I'd love to see some kinds of uh, uh, special loans available for these kinds of um, people who are starting or, or building up these kinds of businesses. And we do have this Healthy Soils Action Plan component that I'm working on, which we're wrapping up, I think, in August. Um, we've mapped all the soils of Massachusetts. You can see all these little red ones here are wetlands, because wetlands are incredibly high in soil carbon. Um, coastal wetlands are especially high in soil carbon. So we've mapped the state's soil carbon to the best of our ability, and we're making recommendations, policy recommendations for the state on what can be done to preserve the soil carbon we have, as well, we're looking broader at soil health, but preserve the soil carbon we have and how to uh, increase it, including lawn care policies and things like that, um, where we're able to do that, which is a lot of which is about protecting forests and wetlands uh, even better. We have some sort of smarter development, um, but also looking at the kinds of grasslands that are managed by the state. A lot of a lot of lawn is managed by the state right now. Um, uh, agriculture, I'll, I will close with our analysis of the state of Massachusetts overall. 55% forest, 13% wetlands, 11% impervious, meaning parking lots and roads and roofs. 11% of the state of Massachusetts is a parking lot or a roof or a road. That's not great. 9% uh, turf grass and 4% agriculture. So carbon farming is not really that important in Massachusetts. Turf grass management is really important in Massachusetts. Wetland protection is really important in Massachusetts. But there are opportunities, even in impervious landscapes, to plant trees, street trees, and things like that. So each of these. Um, land use classes we're trying to come up with our recommendations for. We've done a bunch of, um, like, uh, um, what do you call them, open hearings and stuff around the state to get people's ideas, things like that. Did anybody go to any of those? Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, anyway, so those are just a couple of thoughts at the state level. These are going to come out over the next year, and that'll be an opportunity to let the state know that you'd like to see them um, implement these. This is part of the state's effort to stay compliant with the Paris Agreement, even while the federal government is not. And there's a big state effort that's looking at kind of everything but land in terms of how can we get to uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 that the governor is taking pretty seriously. So we're kind of one uh, complementary component coming along with that. So. Um, uh, if you'd like to learn more, the, uh, I have a website for the book that has lots of information. You could buy the book or read it from your local library. There's a bunch of them in libraries around here. Uh, and then Drawdown, um, we do have this brand new product, the Drawdown Review, and there's lots of information on the website there as well if you want to read about more about nutrient management or 
about all the different ways to produce rice with less methane. I didn't talk about rice tonight. Massachusetts is not a big rice growing area, so decided to let that one go. So I think with that, we can um, take some uh, questions. We have time for one or two questions. I'd actually like to start with any of the students in the audience that want to ask questions. And I'll come to you to help with the mic. And I'll try and be good and do short answers. Hi, you had talked about productive restoration happening in Colorado, but I was wondering if there's any happening in the Pioneer Valley. Uh, yeah, there are some folks doing productive riparian barriers here. Uh, there's a group, the Regenerative Design Group has been doing a bunch of those. Um, I don't know more than that, but I would love to see lots of that. And we've been talking about that here, about some of the um, land that's managed by Smith might be a good candidates for that. And also the um, Grow Food Northampton is also looking at implementing some projects. I'll start with maybe one more question from students, and then I'll also point out that Eric will be joining us over at Lyman, and, and we'll be able to answer some questions there as well. Okay, I think we had a community question up here. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, when you're talking about the personal land management and lawns, it, it um, reminded me, I, I never know what to do with my brush. Um, because they won't take it at the dump, and um, you can't fit it in my um, composter, and um, there's a lot of it. And most people burn it, which obviously is not, you know, carbon neutral. So um, I'm kind of at a loss what to do with all my br brush. In the absence of having a chipper, yes. Sometimes I just cut it up in little pieces this big and throw it on the ground under the trees. Oh, hold on one second. We'll use the mic so we can pick it up. Sure. Is there anybody collecting it for biochar? Because that's really the best use for it. I don't know if anyone's doing that here. Um, in Holyoke, we have collection of that, and they compost those kinds of like uh, yard waste and stuff. So town by town, that's really different. Does anybody know a good place? What town are you in? Anybody know a good place? Nope. Can you bring it to Northampton if you're not from Northampton? Need a sticker. Uh, I will keep thinking about that. Maybe you'll have another thought over at the over at the house. Yeah. You can. Uh, you know, there are a lot of high energy things you can do with it, like sterilize it and grow mushrooms in it. That's kind of a lot of work. It's really fun and they're delicious, but it's a big project. Yeah. Not the not the basic level. One more, maybe. Sure. I was curious. Um, why draw down divided trees into so many sections that it diminished for everybody the importance of, I mean, f trees are number one, really. Well, it's not my call, wasn't my call, but we are working on a, a, a new publication that would sort of bring all of our tree solutions together in one place. We also are looking at doing that around water. There are a whole bunch of different ways to slice it and um, all of them need to be put out there because they're all all those different lenses of looking at are really important. Water is the other one we hear the most. We hear the trees and we hear water a lot. Those are the two that we we have we have heard you, and we're working on it. Yeah. Let's uh, give Eric one more round of applause, please. Great. Thanks very much. We'll see you all over at Lyman. If you're not sure where to go, just follow everybody else.